This fireside chat with Christopher Millen and Leslie Kane was presented in December of 2022 in New York City at an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon. We've recently announced the next conference event in this series, which will be happening on Saturday, April 8th, 2023, in New York City and online. We'll again be joined by Leslie Kane, along with Ryan Graves, Derek Pitts, James Fox, Elizabeth Crone, Peter Lavinda, and Dr. Daniel Ingram. Hosted by Leslie, James Iandoli, and me, J. Christopher King. Tickets to join us online are now available at aninquiry2023.rsvpfi.com, but they're going fast. That link is down in the show notes and also in the comments. We're looking forward to the upcoming conference, and we hope to see you there. If you like this video, you can subscribe to our channel for more great content in the days ahead. And now, we bring you Leslie Kane and Christopher Mellon. These two wonderful, significant figures need no introduction. Uh, so I'll just let it rip. Uh, we've got Leslie Kane and Mr. Christopher Mellon. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a huge honor. Thank you. I don't think Chris Mellon really does need any introduction. So if, if somebody doesn't know who he is, you guess you'll have to look it up because we want to we want to keep the time. And I, I just want everyone to know, this is really his time. This is time for Chris to talk, not me. I'm, I'm basically going to ask him a few questions, and then we are going to open it up to the audience to ask questions. So we just thought this would be a nice format for Chris, if that's how he wanted to do it. So I think well, I'm going to try to bring up with Chris what I think is probably on everybody's minds. And I think there are two really important things first. One is this report that was supposed to come out that hasn't come out. And Chris probably knows something about that. And the second thing is the legislation that involves protections for whistleblowers, as long as, as, as well as other elements of that legislation that are really important. Chris is an expert on that legislation. So you want to just start by talking about those two things? Yeah. Years of effort to convince the Senate Intelligence Committee to act for that ask for that report uh what happened was after i brought the videos to the new york times brought lou to the new york times uh i worked with helene and and uh and leslie and her colleagues uh in making the direction of senator reed and so forth i was concerned that okay we've had this surge of interest and attention but now what you know this is just going to subside the issue is going to go off the radar. What more can we do to bolster the legitimacy, the validity of the of the the topic, to to keep it in the eye of Congress and the public, and to help further establish the legitimacy and the need to to pursue this? And at the time, uh, we're talking 2018. Uh, at this point, there is still tremendous skepticism, if not outright hostility, to the topic. There's no prospect of getting any appropriations. There is no prospect of getting any legislation of any significance, but I knew from my time working on the Hill, one thing that you could do is simply ask for a report. It doesn't require any explicit funding. It's just something that, that the, the legislative branch can do to ask for information. And I had written op-eds about it and made multiple trips to D.C. and spoken to the staff and so forth. And I was thrilled and amazed when, when later, to their great credit, uh, Senator Rubio and Senator Warner uh, and their staff selected to do that, notwithstanding the still considerable stigma. It's easy to recommend something like that if you're not the person who bears the onus and you're not you know, responsible for these elected officials to publicly take that step and put their names on it and be associated. It was a, an extraordinary thing, very much to their credit. Um, it was framed, of course, very explicitly and, and straightforwardly as a national security issue. Why are these things overflying our military bases? And that gave them the political space and cover to engage on this. It wasn't written in terms of anything extraterrestrial or anything like that. But nevertheless, it's an important way to help surface a lot of valuable data and to engage the system. And uh, this second report is now late. It's overdue. That's not surprising. Uh, it's commonplace routine for these reports to be late. 
And not only that, in fact, sometimes they often are never even submitted. Congress will ask for these, and it's a matter of comedy. There is no sanction that falls upon the executive branch if they blow the Congress off and don't submit the report. It really comes down to how much do the senators or congressmen really want this, how much of a, who's going to go to bat if we don't uh, submit the report they want, what are the consequences, and if they sense that nobody really cares about it, which sometimes happens, they go, oh, it's just some staff guys who want it, they don't even bother to submit it. So um, it, it's not as though there's a the criminal, you know, some legal requirement they really have to do it. It's a matter of comedy between the branches. I understand that report is on the desk of the Director of National Intelligence. She's at the Reagan Library uh, today, I believe, making a, a speech on, on some issue out there. Um, because it's lengthy, because it's detailed, they have, the, the Congress has added a lot of specific questions to this report. Uh, they want a lot of information about whether we see connections to foreign governments, is there a threat, um, and so on. And these reports also go through a lot of internal coordination in the executive branch, and different people along the way have a chance to stop and say, you know, I challenge that, I don't believe that, prove it to me, get somebody here to brief me. Every time that happens, it has to get rewritten, it gets sent back. But the good news is that they they, they know that this Congress really does care and uh, that they are going to need to deliver this report. It is on her desk. I was expecting it, hoping uh, that it would be released prior to our meeting today so we could talk about the content of it. That, unfortunately, hasn't happened, but I think that'll be out very soon. Excellent. Lots of good news. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the other thing that I think has been on people's minds is a lot of discussion about the whistleblower protections in the legislation. And, you know, do you see that over the next year or two that it's likely that people will be coming forward with information provided to Congress? And how likely is it that that will ever become public? That's the other big question. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> let me say, back up for just a second, because there's some of the things that I think are of interest to this, to this audience that you're not likely aware of because the press doesn't cover this. So it's extraordinary to me that at a time when Congress is not passing a lot of legislation on, on virtually anything on a bipartisan basis these days, we have legislation pending right now that not only has this important whistleblower provision, which I'll talk a bit more about, it requires a review of all historical documents from the intelligence community relating to the UAP uh, issue all the way back to World War II. It requires <clears throat> the Defense Department, the intelligence community, the Department of Homeland Security to review and identify any non-disclosure agreements related to UAP uh, whatsoever and to submit those to this new office that's being created. Uh, the director of that office um, is being given bodies from every member of the, every component of the intelligence community and the military services. So this is a well-resourced, well-funded operation. It's not like the UAP task force, which was sort of notional and they had a couple of people in an office. This is a serious, well-resourced organization. The Congress is demanding that this person reports into the highest levels of the Defense Department and the intelligence community. And those departments are under direction from Congress to support this operation. He's also putting, has to put together a collection plan to use this massive apparatus that we have that has exquisite technical capabilities, far beyond what, what uh, the public is generally aware of. I've tried to describe some of that at an unclassified level. You can find some of those articles on, on my websites because this has been a huge frustration for me as somebody interested in this topic even before, long before I became aware and got publicly involved uh, with this issue, I was curious about this topic, keenly interested in it. In all those years I was in the intelligence community, and I used to get these briefings on these incredible satellites we have and signals intelligence capabilities and radars. They could see something the size of a tennis ball 20,000 miles away. And all of this stuff, we're not using any of it to try to find out what these things are, where they're coming from immensely frustrating. Well, that's happening now. He has to develop a collection plan. He has to develop a science plan to look at 
uh, what kinds of propulsion uh, capabilities might be behind what we're observing. So this is very far-reaching legislation uh, that, that is on the verge of being enacted. It also includes this in extraordinary whistleblower provision. So what they're saying is that notwithstanding any secrecy agreement that you've signed pursuant to the existing executive order which governs classification or the Atomic Energy Act, which is a very, very important additional uh, component of this because, uh, again, you know, this is kind of down in the weeds, you know, for most people, but there's a separate statutory basis for anything to do with nuclear weapons, nuclear plants. They have their own classification system. So regardless of any of the above, if you have information regarding a classified UAP, U.S. government program or activity, anything having to do with recovered materials or collection or efforts to conceal this or to manipulate public opinion or anything of that kind, this new office is directed to create a secure process by which to receive that information and validate it and report it to Congress. Um, they are going to be putting up a public website so that people can reach out and contact them. I am personally happy to uh, answer any questions if there's anyone who's considering taking advantage of this. A couple of attorneys um, have offered to work pro bono to answer questions about this. Um, if people have concerns, it's noteworthy that this legislation stipulates that if in the event that there was any um, uh, kind of retaliation against someone who does come forward, they can sue not only for compensatory damages for any lost salary rating, they can sue for punitive damages. They could get a large multiple of whatever their salary is or whatever damages that they suffered. The U.S. government cannot declare bankruptcy over this, uh, you know, or, and, and escape judgment on this. So that's a, a very serious sanction. The legislation also provides for injunctive relief for anyone who comes forward. So if there's somebody working at Lockheed Martin on some program and they come out through this process and Lockheed Martin were to try to do something, they could also get a court order uh, to uh, overturn that and to remain in their position until the issue is finally adjudicated. There is also uh, inspector general uh, protection available to these people so they don't have to hire an attorney. Uh, they would have the option of going to court, but even without doing so, if they're part of the community, the inspector general will take up their case on their behalf and investigate it for them. Um, and there are also criminal sanctions that are already on the books against taking action against anyone uh, from who approaches Congress with, with whistleblower information. So uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, features of this legislation that should reassure anybody who is considering coming forward. I think it's an, it's an incredible, unprecedented opportunity to at long last get to the bottom of longstanding uh, allegations, perceptions, rumors about what does the U.S. government really know about this topic. Now, to your question, will it remain classified? The process involves reporting to Congress. The unclassified reports that were the, like the one we're waiting for will continue as long as this office remains in effect. The whistleblower uh, provisions and that information will remain in classified channels, but it will be delivered to multiple committees on the Hill and to the congressional leadership. What they do with the information at that point is up to them. So they have procedures and, and uh, they have the possibility if they want to, to take the information public uh, or to declassify it. It's, they're rarely used procedures, but they could do that. They could do decide if this uh, becomes a reality and they get confirmatory information to go to the White House and say, you know, we can't sit on this. You've got to come to grips with this. You've got to tell the public. We won't know until we get to that point. I know some people are disappointed that that there's not a uh, you know immediate automatic declassification. I would only 
suggest to people that this is huge progress and, and a huge opportunity. And I hope if there are people that have this information, they'll come forward. And um, I'm actually trying to help identify people and encouraging people in the community. And if you know anybody who might have pertinent information, uh, please uh, uh, avail them of, of this information so they know this opportunity is there. Um, I have a, a Proton email account. It's my initial CKM1 at protonmail.com. I will try to answer as best I can any questions people may have. And I'm willing to put people in touch with uh, the Congress or this new office. Um, so it's, I mean, what's going on right now? Frankly, I know there's some people that are still, you know, would like to see it be, you know, change, happy to glad, whatever. To be where we're at today from where we started is amazing. It's absolutely miraculous that the U.S. Congress is stepping up on a totally bipartisan basis. Both houses of Congress and both parties are behind this legislation. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Boy. What do you think is motivating the ones that care, that seem to care about this? I mean, what what do they have this kind of deep connection to this? Do they have their own experiences? What is motivating the Congress to recognize this? Why do they think it's really important? Is it only because they think this is some kind of threat or is it something more than that? So and I think it's a couple of things. First of all, the way that we frame this, we the Lou and I and a few people who went to the Hill with this was, you know, we, we knew that we could, we, we had to give the members political space to engage on this. And the best way to do that was to, in our discussions with them, focus on a very narrow, specific, vital national security issue, which is somebody's overflying our Defense Department bases and facilities. And we don't know who it is. And that's not acceptable. And this was not just going on like once in a while. This was, if you listen to Ryan Graves and these other products, this was happening on a weekly, almost daily basis out in training areas. And by the way, let's not assume or leap to the conclusion that these things are necessarily alien or anything like it. A lot of kids, we just don't know. I mean, they could be Russia, they could be Chile. We got to keep an open mind. But the point is, they're, they're all, nobody is comfortable with the idea that sovereign U.S. airspace is being violated on a regular basis and we don't know who's doing it. So that's something that everybody could agree on. And so that is what has really enabled this progress first and foremost. In addition, of course, these members, like the rest of us, they're deeply, deeply curious, right? Everybody wants to know. They all, you know, you, you hear some of the members coming out of the classified briefings saying things like, wow, that's whatever that is. I don't think it's the Chinese or the Russians or, or it's, and we know it's not us. And so many of them have this larger possibility on their minds and they're fairly open about it. And I think everybody involved has this innate human cu curiosity and, and desire to want to know it's such a, well, I shouldn't say everybody there. <laughs> there are people who don't want to know. Actually, I think about it. There are people that don't want to know. Uh, I find that hard to relate to, but you know, it, it is a, uh, for many people, a destabilizing, upsetting, disturbing possibility. And, uh, but uh, so I think it's a mixture of things as it was for me and as it is it what is for many yeah. others. Maybe you could say a little more and then we'll, we'll open this up. But I'm just, you know, from your own personal journey with this and you've seen this remarkable change, like how is it for you and what what draws you to this? What Why is it important to you personally? So in my case, um, I've never seen a UFO, but I, know, I was a young boy, seven years old at a boarding school outside of Chicago, Illinois. And the principal, a friend of the principal of our school had taken a, a, a home movie of a UFO that flew over his, his backyard in broad daylight. This was not, you know, a light moving around the night sky. You could see this thing big and bold. It was stunning. It was this huge, like, 
bronze glowing golden disc shaped object and it was massive and it came over and it banged jelly and it went into a cloud and as it went into the cloud you know clouds look kind of like flat and two-dimensional almost cumulus clouds when you see what it this is when you see something go into it you realize how wispy it is this is before computer generated imagery i don't think anybody could po i don't understand how anyone could conceivably have manipulated this or created this effect and you can see it go into it until it finally disappeared and then it came out the other side so that just set my hair on fire as a little kid wow. and i went out and i'm reading every book i could find and when i got to college i did a, a independent study project for a physics professor and the more i started to research it the more i started to realize that this was happening internationally it was happening with airline pilots it was happening with local people so uh, where I was an undergraduate in, in, uh, in New England, for example, and I still have my scrapbook from, from college days when I started collecting articles on this, there was a uh, police officer who we were all afraid of because he would catch us speeding to the ski resort on weekends, yeah, Officer Hensby. And he, he, Officer Hensby had this experience that was written up in the newspaper he and his wife are coming back from an event, and he's, he's stone cold sober, and there's a car pull over by the side of the road. There's some people standing there. And he pulls up to see if they need assistance, and they're like, man, don't go up over that hill. You're going to see something you don't want to see. And they jump in their car, and they take off. So Hensby goes up the hill with his wife, and this object comes down and blocks the road. Wow. And he's like blinded, but he backs up the, the car, and the object goes up again into the sky. He starts going forward. It comes down and blocks the road again. And the third time he turns around and this kind of stuff was being reported in this rural area among people that have no prior interest connection to the issue. And when I started talking to people more and more, I started realizing how commonplace it was for people to have these experiences. So it, it attained a degree of legitimacy in my mind and then I always wondered about it, and when I entered the government, I always kept an eye out for it, and every once in a while, like a friend of mine who knew I was interested, like a Navy pilot would call me up and say, you wouldn't believe what happened today. And those kind of things would occur sporadically. And uh, But meanwhile, this incredible apparatus that you all paid for, the taxpayer paid for, that every day is collecting gazillions of bits and bytes and and uh, of data from all manner of exquisite technologies that are mostly classified but really impressive stuff and nobody's using it to try to find out what these things are where they're coming from and so i am just enthralled that we're to a point now where somebody's it's being taken seriously they're putting a serious program in place a collection plan a science plan uh, reporting procedures, all the intelligence community uh, components, the services, the combat, combatant commands uh, down at the field level, they all now are ha have a channel to report this, a place it all comes into. Before 9-11, we had this problem with the FBI and CIA were not sharing information, for example. In the aftermath of 9-11, one of the conclusions was, well, if they had been sharing information, we might have been able to prevent that attack. Well, this was has been going on in spades in the UAP issue. Uh, myriads of these different agencies and departments have been, data has been coming into their various data buckets by different means, depending on what the organization is, signals intelligence, maze of intelligence, imagery intelligence, whatever. But nobody had a requirement to share it, report it, do anything with it. It was that kind of thing on steroids in terms of lack of information sharing. That is being fixed now. So our government is getting serious about this. And one way or another, we can expect real headway and real progress. And I think going forward, we'll see that in these reports. As more data becomes available and more assets are being used to collect this information. And listen, we have this man to thank for the reason that all of this happened. Mm -hmm. Right. We would. True. You're, you're, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with people. I live in a remote rural area where nobody cares about this issue. Yeah. 
Nobody ever asked me about it. Every once in a while, somebody will stop me at the grocery store. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's sad. I saw you on this History Channel show, I think. Was that you? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so it's a pleasure to be around people who share a, a passion because uh, I, I really uh, have been working on this almost every day, continue to. Yeah. And uh, yeah. but the good news is that we're we're having we're seeing incredible progress. I mean, we're at a point now I never I did would not have wagered any amount of money that we get this far this fast yeah me neither. me neither so it is an amazing moment and i think with that maybe we can let the audience ask some questions sure yeah I'm sure they're all e very eager to do that yep um i i uh I've, i'll take one from the live stream first and uh then the next hand i saw up was mitch horowitz we'll do that okay um Question for Christopher Mellon. You have recently helped bring attention to some of the incredible sensor systems the U.S. has, such as the space fence. Is this because you think they are potentially good data sources, or are you personally aware of cases where UAP have been detected operating in space or underwater by these or other sensor systems? Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is where I have to be careful. <laughs> uh, I am aware of cases like that, and um, I'm also aware there's tremendous resistance still, particularly in the Air Force. They have a cultural antipathy towards this issue that is extraordinary, and it's deep. And I've written about this. I wrote an, ar an article called Why is the Air Force AWOL on the UFO issue? Uh, on the UAP issue, and so they operate, own and operate the space vents and the, all those big ground-based radars and NORAD, and they control space surveillance. One of the things that I uh, can share, one, I could say, yes, there are incidents of that kind, absolutely. Uh, incidents continue. Um, I have to be careful, of course, uh, because, you know, I, 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 I have to walk this line uh, because I still do some classified consulting work. And obviously, um, there are a lot of people that have gone to jail. I don't know if you're aware of this the last few years for leaking classified information, discussing quite some very serious, serious offense. The best way I can answer your question, perhaps, is to give you an example or two that are that are unclassified or that other people have said something so I can reference what they said. Um, so I interviewed a NORAD colonel for the uh, History Channel show, uh, Unidentified, uh, Colonel James Cobb, and he described in a case at NORAD headquarters where he walked into work one day, and uh, if you've been to Cheyenne Mountain, it's kind of like they depicted in the movies with a big screen and, you know, this big room where they're monitoring all the traffic over North America, et cetera. And there was an object coming down from the North Pole approaching the United States. And the commander of NORAD, according to, to Jim, said, I want that thing. So everybody, they had everything on strip alert on the entire East Coast of the United States up in the air trying to get a radar lock on this thing. And they tracked it all the way down the East Coast of the United States. They could not catch it. They could not engage it. But they, they all, they had multiple sensor systems tracking it, and it disappeared out over the Caribbean, over Cuba, and last seen heading towards the South Atlantic. So wow. that kind of thing does happen. That was in the 90s. That was late, which is why he could talk about it. If it happened last week, we couldn't talk about it. But, but it was not a unique event by any stretch. Um, it's not like a daily kind of thing, but those things have been happening. The... Historical record, uh, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, there are a number of other examples and cases like that that are available. I think when this histor historical document review is completed, we're going to find yet many more other examples of these kinds of things coming to light. All right, we need one that shows something coming from space. Yeah, well, you know, is, this is so interesting you know, because... That's definitive. It, you're really hitting a... I, I am so with you, and I... When the House Intelligence Committee had their hearing, I contacted some of the staff. I wrote questions, posted them on the web. I sent them some questions. And the number one thing I was hitting was the space issue. I remember. Because 
if we can demonstrate cases on orbit, nobody can say, well, it's helicopters or it's Chinese lanterns or it's swamp gas or something like that. Right. And um, it's the Air Force initially, to get back to this theme of their resistance to discussing this issue openly, they actually were telling the Congress in the first few years of this process and with these reports, well, we don't need to tell you about anything on space because UAP stands for Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. So notwithstanding that they were playing, I'm not, I'm going to kid you not. I have, I'm kidding. I, this is absolutely for real. Congressional staff have, have showed me some of the, uh, I've seen some of the correspondence on this and they were playing that semantic game and hiding behind that to not have to address this issue. Um, this isn't to say that this is a commonplace thing, and it's a very complex environment. There's a tremendous amount of space to up there. And other nations are also have secret space programs, and they're moving things around, and somebody puts, somebody puts a satellite, and a little thing comes off the satellite and moves away. And it's a very active field of, of competition and subterfuge these days. But nevertheless, it's a great question it's a really important question. I think it's something that could help bridge the legitimacy of the issue in the minds of the broader public. Because even when we have the U.S. government saying this is real, and even when we have Aegis-class cruisers tracking these things, and we have Navy pilots seeing them in broad daylight as it's being tracked and confirmed by the radar, and we get an infrared radar, there's still people saying, you know, oh, it must have been, you know, something you know, something else or one of our secret projects or something like that. And I think if people could understand that, that this is happening in that uh, venue as, as well, that would, would have a big impact. And I, I hope they will continue to press for information on that because I don't think they're getting a full read yet. Yeah. Um. I want to thank you both for your uh, extraordinary efforts at public transparency. And I have a question for Secretary Mellon uh, regarding the... Please just call me Chris. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> I thought I would err on the side of uh, formality. Um, by the way, I'm dressed probably. Yes. It, it's, what do you mean? Um, I, <clears throat> I have a question pertaining to the pending whistleblower protections. And you've touched on some of this already, but I wonder if it could be unpacked a little further. In agencies, when there are instances of retaliation against a whistleblower or apathy toward sharing data or concealment of data, in your experience, and I realize this may be a multitude of different things, what are the motives? What are the motives behind impeding flow of information and data? It's hard for me to generalize about that. In the specific case of UAP, there's very little predicate. There, are, you know, it's hard to come up with many. I know of one case um, that comes to mind, um, and uh, it's not fully. Re it's not something I can discuss in detail. Um, but historically, I can't think of cases really that are. UAP related with whistleblowers. Whistleblower legislation is not something I have a lot of experience with. These cases are often very contentious, very controversial. That body of people, sometimes you get individuals who are whistleblowers, who are people that have, you know, issues and they're making a, uh, you know, uh, incredible allegations that don't always pan out. Sometimes those people are unreliable. Other times they're absolutely right. There is a statute that I understand that if you identify some uh, uh, abuse of federal contracting or acquisition, you can actually personally profit, get some kind of reward through the system. Uh, I'm not familiar with the details, but I, I understand that provision has been used a number of times. So I think it's really, it's, it's important, uh, and I wish I had more background expertise. Uh, the Governmental Affairs Committee has typically, historically been the committee that's dealt with whistleblower legislation, never worked on that committee. There's a big body of precedent and practice surrounding that. It's, Senator Grassley was the real champion of that over the years. 
So I, I think the best thing for me to do is say, frankly, I'm, I'm probably not the best guy to address that any further. Hi, uh, Chris, Bob McGuire. Um, no. I, uh, I was on the USS Hampton in 1998 or nine. I can't remember what it was, eight or nine. Heard of USO. Uh, I was on the USS Blue Ridge in 2008. We went through a typhoon and something larger than the Blue Ridge blocked all the rain off the ship. So uh, I got kind of motivated and uh, I uh, started working on some citizen science apparatus which used uh, machine learning equipment, optical gear, radio gear, do passive radar, stuff like that was started with UAPTN. Then Sky Hub is now Sky 360. And lastly, Paula Bright and I were driving down US 40 and we had a triangle over our car, clear as day. Well, US 40 is where? Uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Right on the Brook Hands. Okay. Okay. We had a triangle over our car for minutes. Look, uh, so my. But my question is quick. What role do you see, if any, for citizen science apparatus to bypass all its classification? Yeah, so um, it's, it's, I, I think there's a, I mean, I'm devoting, I, I'm a volunteer with the Galileo Project and uh, working assiduously uh, on a pro bono basis to uh contribute to citizen science. I had a meeting this morning before I came over here with uh, a startup company that is trying to uh, acquire data and develop an app for people to input data for the for the citizenry. I think it's, there's uh, this explosion of, of interest in technical expertise that's emerging is wonderful. And uh, I think it's hopefully going to develop, become synergistic. I think the government could benefit from that ultimately uh, billions of people with smartphone cameras and and eyes and gray matter between their heads it's so the reason i asked about the triangle and the location was because a, a navy officer contacted me over linkedin a couple of years ago not far from that area he had an incident with a triangle uh that he saw and, and he sketched it out in incredible detail uh it was clearly deeply affected by it, uh, didn't know what to make of it. I actually put him in touch with the then UAP task force to report that. But the answer to your question, um, I think it's very promising. And I think, you know, one of the big mega trends that we see uh, writ large is the government outsourcing more and more. So whereas NASA used to build the shuttle and control the whole process, now they're looking to SpaceX and other people because the private sector is faster, more efficient, and so forth. Um, the government even, you know, there's inherently governmental functions, but even when I was in the Pentagon, a lot of the, uh, you know, like my secretary was a contractor. Uh, the government is relying on the private sector more and more. And I think that trend is just going to continue. And hopefully these partnerships between the government and the private sector will flourish. I've been hoping and encouraging uh, greater uh, I've worked with the Scientific Coalition for UFOlogy to try to help them to the extent that I can. So I'm a big believer and I'm a big supporter, and I think it's very promising. Sir, I uh, just wanted to ask, what do you think state and local government's role should be in this post-disclosure? or Yeah, I think... Yeah, so interesting. They they get some really interesting data, and uh, sometimes some of the stuff that happens at the state and local level, there was this big incident, you may recall, maybe two years ago now out west in the sort of the Nebraska-Wyoming area with all these mysterious drones that were being afforded by ranchers. And it was state and local authorities who responded. And uh, I talked to, I called one of the sheriff's deputies out there. It was fascinating. <clears throat> this This individual... Uh, responded to a call from a farmer uh, and they had this farmer had seen like 20 or 30 lights over his property and he he was uh, responding in a truck and he, he pulled over got out his binoculars and watched and this object came up and these smaller lights went into the larger object and that object went flying just at a 
incredible speed when shooting past his squad car. And, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, they, there's, they, you know, with the time that happened, there was no, you know, we're starting to get to the point where there'll be a mechanism for those things to feed into a larger, what we call fusion center. Like we now we have the, after 9-11, they created the global counterterrorism center where regardless state, local, federal, FBI, CIA, whatever, any terrorism information goes in there so we can put the puzzles on the table at one place, do all the pieces of the puzzle in one place and see them all together. So I think they have a role in that and it, it could be an important role. Hey, Chris, uh, DJ from Calling All Beings. Um, with regard to the nature of these UAPs that are being experienced by naval pilots and other uh, military pilots and civilian pilots for that matter, um, if, with regard to the global power competition, if the origin, if some people, you know, hypothesize that perhaps the origin is uh, one of those global power competition nations like Russia or China, then the next question would be if they have a, a propulsive technology that's that advanced, we could assume that they have an offensive capability that's equally advanced, like without a lot of extrapolation. So why would they not be flying combat sorties over, yeah. over very important uh, sites within the United States if they can fly with impunity and surveil? So this is a great question. And so one of the things that was interesting about the first unclassified report, we're all waiting for the next one to come out. The first one was interesting the way the media covered it. So the report came out and said, okay, it, it, it had all kinds of shortcomings, right? NORAD data was not, every year NORAD has 1,800, 2,000 uncorrelated tracks. None of those were in there. They said from 2000, there was nothing, they didn't include any space data, they didn't include any undersea data, they didn't include the NORAD data, but they still said we have 144 incidents since 2004. And uh, none of those, one of them we could explain, and none of them, we don't see any connection to Russia or China, and we know they're not ours any of those incidents and the media stories were not aliens <laughs> sorry I was like, okay so if it's not russia and it's not china it's not us who is it i mean it was kind of you know consistent with the possibility the hypothesis that maybe some of these things are coming from somewhere else um and and that remains the case so then the house hearing came along and they reported all of a sudden they went from 140 to 400 we're still not talking about anything in space or under the ocean. We're still not talking about those thousands of uncorrelated NORAD tracks, but now the number suddenly bumped up and there's still no indication it's Russia or China. I think your point is correct. If it was Russia, we'd be seeing on the battlefield some evidence that they had these capabilities. On the other hand, bear in mind that a lot of these reports are not necessary are not of things that are demonstrating radical propulsion technology. Not all of them. Some of them are, the Nimitz case being a classic example. Many of the other cases, though, are more ambiguous, and they might turn out to be Chinese. For example, these Navy ships that have these swarms of lights going on around them. It's hard to understand how they can be drones as long as they're in the air in some cases. The, the amount of energy required, where would they be launching from? They're, they're, they're still strange, and I don't think this next report is going to show that we have an explanation for them yet contrary to a recent new york times story by julian barnes i i i don't i i don't i don't think that's the case but there is a wide range of activity and in some cases you have things that are doing stuff that's totally beyond our anything we have even on the drawing boards you know, stuff coming down from 80,000 feet, hovering, and then shooting off at hypersonic speeds. But there are a lot of other cases where we have things that aren't necessarily moving quickly or, or doing radical propulsion, you know, evincing radical propulsion, but they're still unexplained and unidentified. So at the end of the day, you know, that's all going to be sorted out. And some of those things might turn out to be, you know, Chinese drones. They, they recently publicized the fact that they have a drone that can go underwater that can go from the air to the water and back. I don't think the drones that we're seeing are those, in part because this article suggests that they were sort of touting it as a new breakthrough. If they, I'm not sure why they'd be doing publicity if they had a secret capability that had already be developed and deployed. But, you know, those, 
but your point it, it is is well taken, particularly with regard to Russia. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a question from the live stream. Um, Mr. Mellon, is there a way to counter the negative attitude of the Air Force? Ah, well, you know, there's changes happening. Uh, and I see, I was really enthralled and encouraged. Some young Air Force folks got in touch with me who were uh, affiliated with the Blue Angels a few years ago. And they were excited and interested about this topic. I think a lot of the younger people coming up through the ranks are. Uh, also, pilots, Air Force pilots are beginning to report. Personally, I think the Air Force, frankly, has been guilty to some degree of contempt of Congress. And until somebody, and I'm not talking, uh, the, the degree to which they have been able to stiff arm and sort of blow off the Congress, nobody has ever called their bluff. You know, there's a famous story, at least in recent years, about Ray Kroc managing McDonald's and how did he establish early on this sort of standard of cleanliness across all these, all these outlets? He didn't do it by sending around a memo. You can't have, you know, flies in the kitchen. He went into one of the franchises and there were flies in the kitchen. He shut that guy down and word got out to everybody and Truman fired MacArthur. And I think unless and until somebody holds these people accountable at some point and draws a line and says that doesn't cut it, or, you know, you're fired, some of this may continue. But I, I'm kind of surprised that some people in the Hill haven't sat some of these people down in the chair and said, hey, just no more fooling around here. We want the bottom line. And I, I haven't seen that happen to date. But I think that ultimately is what produces a sea change in attitude. You get the behavior you accept sometimes. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leslie. Uh, it's Jay here from Project okay. Unity. Good to see you both. Really enjoying this. Um, I wanted to ask, just in relation to the uh, the whistleblower testimony that's potentially coming in through the legislation and the quest to try and find people that may be able to provide actionable intelligence in relation to those types of subjects in a congressional setting, Chris, do you know if anyone has attempted to or have you personally attempted to reach out to Admiral Bobby Ray Inman? Who is uh, you know? I know some... people that have, yeah, huh, and uh, and didn't lead to any interesting insights or information. <laughs> well, that's what happened on my interview of him, but I'm pretty pretty <laughs> sure. Pretty you're not sure. alone. I can tell you, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Hi, here's a quick, easy one. Should potential whistleblowers fear for their lives? I don't have any reason to think that. It, you know, there've been, you know, I know some people that have felt that they've been harassed, and people who have in the community, in the government. I know a few people who have had some incidents that have made them suspect that maybe somebody was trying to intimidate them. Um, I have not had that experience. I would have thought I might have been a candidate to be have a car accident or something early on because. <laughs> I was making a lot of, you know, noises and fuss and getting this, you know, in front of the press and the Congress. Uh, and I haven't had any of those experiences. I don't know anyone who has. So I don't have any reason to think that. Um, I do. I do think that um, there are people that I think people need to be careful and follow the law and use the the processes that are made available to avoid repercussions. One of the things that I would caution people about is if, if you don't use these processes and you spill the beans on some program that you signed a non-disclosure agreement of regarding outside of school, uh, you could be at serious risk of, of prosecution. Um, Surprising, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats. The Obama administration set a record for the number of people sent to jail for leaking classified information. So people who are in this community who are kind of straddling the line and doing some work in the intelligence community and have clearances, but also interested in this topic and trying to be helpful, they, they need to be careful to follow the, the laws and the guidelines. I would say it's the main thing.
Hi, Chris. Thanks for doing this. Um, so I, I come from the world of commercial aviation. I'm a flight test engineer. And we've been hearing about reports of increased uh, anomalous sightings by commercial pilots, yeah. especially in like the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, you know, thanks to like people like Ben Hansen and, and the staff of the debrief for doing stories about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so thus far, much of the discussion has been about uh, military encounters um, and the need for better safety procedures. Do you foresee this conversation trickling down into uh, the world of commercial aviation? And if so, how? I, I do. Uh, I understand Ryan Graves has made some headway recently with the AIAA, the American Institute for Astronomics and Avionics, or whatever the correct acronym is, uh, which I, I believe incorporates the commercial pilot community, uh, as I understand it. Um, I think it's great to see these pilots now willing to talk about this, and this stuff is starting to come out. They're posting videos that didn't happen. It, it was happening years ago. They weren't posting the videos or talking about it. They were seeing these kinds of things years ago. I've had a number of pilots contact me on LinkedIn and send me videos before it started. I mean, like, you know, five years ago before this, the bubble recently where it's so, I mean, I know it's been going on. In fact, there are sources with thousands of documented commercial airline pilots over the years. There's a, a website, an organization called NARCAP. Maybe you're familiar with them the former NASA administrator has put together. Um, so I think it's very encouraging. And I think, again, it, it feeds into, uh, uh, can and should feed into the bigger picture and trying to identify patterns and trying to help us understand this phenomenon. There's an, it, there's an, an effort underway to get the United Nations to engage. And my suggestion to those people, to the limited interaction involvement I've had is, Maybe the, there's a, a UN uh, international aviation organization and without creating something new organization or spending a lot of money, maybe they could also become a uh, promulgate some, uh, some rules regarding reporting or facilitate that to help raise the level of awareness. But I, I think they're superb witnesses. They're, utterly credible they have no incentive to be making this stuff up they're they're out there at, at, at the nice guys and sometimes they're seeing incredible stuff all right um here's a question from the live stream chris have you personally done any follow-up in regards to james fox's documentary of the virginia brazil case it's been stated that the u.s air force was involved with that retrieval any investigation into the air force involvement there uh, I, I don't think James would be angry with me if I if I mentioned I spoke with him about this quite a bit in in tried to be helpful to the limited degree I can um, in in his challenge, uh, but I have not been able to uh, do anything on the Air Force side, and uh, I don't know. I think the encouraging news is that with this review of the records and the non-disclosure agreements and, and so forth, uh, to the, if there is an underlying program involving the U S air force, these initiatives should surface that. Great. Okay. Um, last question, because we actually are running into overtime here. Um, what question would you hope to be asked that people don't ask you? And what's the answer to that question? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, interesting. Um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot is um, what if we find this out? Is the net effect positive or negative? Uh, what if we find out, you know, the answer could take various forms. What if we find out we're under observation and have been for a long time? And, um, I've always been of the view that we should just fearlessly follow the facts wherever they go. And that if we don't do that, we become unmoored. We lose our, as a society, as a species, we, we become, uh, we lose our way. That there's really, that's what we have to do is be faithful and follow the facts, but it would be massively disruptive or potentially disruptive. My own view on that is people aren't asked, don't ask me about it. I've read, written about this a little bit. 
I would like to believe it would have a net positive effect. I'm concerned that we're on a very dangerous trajectory internationally on a potential collision course with Russia and or China, that the biggest challenges we face as a species, whether it's global warming, whether it's proliferation of, of weapons of mass destruction, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's the continued evolution of biotechnology and the fact that, that people in more and more disparate places can create more and more potentially lethal, contagious things. All those things, our, our survival, I think, long-term depends on unprecedented levels of collaboration. And when I try to think about things that could shake up the existing paradigm and cause humanity to rethink where we're at and what we're about and how we relate to one another, maybe this is something that could have that effect. I would, I would like to think so. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you so much. Let's give one more round of applause. Thank you.